and I don't, I don't really know the drill here in adult Sunday school. I don't do that very often, so I guess you also still have to be quiet, and I guess to say to move towards the front won't matter, so I'm not going to try. Uh, and, you know, the people are going to be camped out all over the place. That's fine, as long as you can hear. Uh, really, this, uh, this shouldn't be happening, right? Because we're, we, it should be that there are two services back to back and that I don't have any opportunity to do this kind of thing. But it seemed good since we had this opportunity. I had something that was kind of on my heart, so I asked Ron if I could, when we, when we discovered that we were going to need another, at least one more, uh, hopefully not next week, but we'll see, one more adult Sunday school where we're all together, I asked if I could do that because I just have something that is particularly on my heart to, to mention. But uh, before we do that, uh, I don't necessarily want to take prayer requests, but I do want to offer a few for you guys to be considering uh, just as we, as we pray as a congregation. Lots of ministries, so I just want to encourage you that as we uh, kind of head into now, hope, again, hopefully with the building finishing up this week, Lord willing, and we've got Kingdom Kids that'll be starting in a couple of weeks. We have our new service times and and our prayer for the Sunday schools that they would become greater opportunities for fellowship as well as greater opportunities for equipping. And I think you guys heard last week the various classes that were going on. And uh, it's, uh, my, my prayer is that you are, are joyfully looking forward to those, those opportunities. But we need to pray that they would be effective. Just offering opportunities doesn't mean that they're going to be effective. They need to, the Spirit of God needs to be active. The Word of God needs to be preached. And the people of God need to be filled with the Spirit. So just that you would pray for those things. Uh, small groups are starting up tonight. And Again, we, we, those aren't, you know, we're not just offering an opportunity. We're, we're praying that in that opportunity that the, that the Spirit of God would be working in our hearts, that our one another's would be, would be strengthened and deepened. So my prayer is, is that not only that we would do those things, but that maybe one of the things you'd be praying for tonight is the other fellowship groups, not just yours, and the opportunities that there are to meet and increase growth in our congregation in depth as a result of that. Uh, obviously, to continue praying for the, for the building, this is, as we finish this out, we have another phase that we're trying to do. Our facilities are, are something that needs to be continually, we need to remember that. It's, it's not a minor issue. It costs a lot of money, and so we want to make sure that we're using that money wisely, as well as that we're using the facilities wisely as the Lord provides them. So please, please, you know, and those who are making the decision process, our, our building ministry, and the elders as they make those decisions, the deacons as they, you know, help carry those out, because these are, are matters of continual prayer. Obviously, then there's, there's lots of ongoing needs within the body that we need to remember. Um, but my prayer is that, that you will have a list of those things, that you're constantly remembering those. Uh, I, I think another thing that I'd, I'd love to see you pray for on a regular basis is that the Lord would continue to raise up leadership, that uh, people would be discipled and that they would be able to enter into the various areas of ministry and leading and various positions, uh, the teaching of the Word that needs to go on, all those things, be, because our goal as a church is to, to build from within, that we would have the strength, the internal strength necessary to really provide for ourselves in the way of teaching and other things. I've been in a lot of churches over the years, uh, and I've been on, on staff at most of them, and w one of the problems always, it seems, in the churches that I was, that I was at was that we always seem to need to bring people from the outside to be, to be strong. We need to get other people so that they could come provide the strength and wisdom that we needed for our ministries. You know, that's what a travesty that is, ultimately. The church ought to be building that, and a local church ought to be doing it. So just, just that you would pray that the Lord continue to deepen and strengthen each one. So lots of things to pray for. There's many others, but that you might consider some of those things, adding those to your times of prayer, uh, that we would continue to be a church that, that is, is building, is training. I think probably the last thing I would say is we need those rising up into leadership positions to guide and direct. We also need every person actively living out the one another. That's what Ephesians 4 says, right? We equip the saints for the works of service, and then the body is only healthy as each individual part of the body accomplishes its purpose. That's everyone. So there's leadership purposes, there's oversight purposes, there's service purposes, giving, all of those things that go on. And our body's not healthy if those things aren't happening. So my prayer is that you'll always be remembering to pray for those things on a consistent basis. Let me open us in prayer then, and we'll, we'll look at our text after that. Father, I thank you for the privilege that we have to be together now. I pray that you would help us to take full advantage of it as we focus our minds on the truths of your word and, and as we consider how it is that we would, we would respond, even in the moment, or that we would be good listeners, that we would be making decisions of uh, humility and, and obedience to your word, even as we hear that our, our mind, our thoughts would be taken captive to obedience to the word of God as it is presented. And or that as a result of the decisions that we make, even as we sit underneath the teaching of the Word of God, that our lives would be changed in the moment and that they would be changed then uh, permanently as we leave from here and initiate those decisions or further things that we've decided to do, or that we would just take this time and, and, and use it 
uh, to the fullest uh, that you have given us to do. Lord, it's so precious to be able to be together this morning and, and to worship you and praise you and hear your word. Father, I pray for our church as many uh, ministries are, are beginning. And Lord, I just ask that they would, they would be powerful and effective because the truths of your word are proclaimed, because the people who proclaim them are ever increasingly being, being conformed to your image, because those who hear are filled with your spirit. Lord, in all of these ways that you would be honored and that the ministries would be effective. Lord, we pray for the uh, small groups that are starting up even tonight, that they, w- they would be well attended, not so we can say that we have many people in fellowship groups, but so that each one can be ministered to and that each member of the body can be exercising to one another. So we just ask that they would be powerful and vibrant, that each group would grow and be strengthened, and Lord, that the, the fellowship and the ministry that goes on in and through those groups would be powerful and would be a, a testimony to our community of your greatness. I want to pray for Kingdom Kids as it starts up in a couple of Wednesdays that you would be with our children, that each of our children would, would come to know you, that they would put faith and trust in you, that their hearts would be changed, and that you would use this ministry as an opportunity for that. Lord, we pray also that those who know you would be strengthened and built up, each one learning in, in, a, uh, in, in a way that is appropriate to what they can understand. We're so grateful that you give us this opportunity, and I pray for Ron and, and others as they lead that, and, and each person who will be involved, that our Kingdom Kids ministry would be powerful and effective. Father, I pray that you would be with the uh, uh, young married ministry that will be starting up, or that you would help the couples who come to that to have a, a joy to be together, to encourage each other, if you give uh, Craig and Yvonne wisdom as they, as they direct that ministry, and as they seek to pour into the lives of, of the young couples, so many that we have in our church, and Lord, I pray that they would be strengthened and build up in their marriages and their parenting so that they might form an ever-increasingly uh, strengthened nucleus of, uh, within our church. Father, I pray that you would uh, continue to bless the ministries that are ongoing and that each one would be powerful and effective. Lord, I pray for the, for the building and the ministry that that is, that you would um, be with James as he oversees and, and directs the, the finalizing of this particular step, that you would grant us favor in the eyes of the city, that we would be able to, to finish out our permits and that we'd be able to finish then the, the building on this level, but that you would direct us to the next, uh, our next stage as well. Or do we ask that these facilities would be used for your glory, that not just be another place to meet or a place to be, but that your name would be exalted and praised here in, in an ever-increasingly effective way, and or that we would use our facilities to the maximum extent for your glory, or that the money that is being poured in, the resources, that uh, all of which are yours, that we would be using them wisely and well, that we would spend wisely, that we would save wisely, that... We would, uh, things would be directed in a way that enables those resources to be best used. Father, we ask uh, that our church would continue to grow and deepen in the things of you. We do we not deserve to be a strong and deep church, but we ask that you might grant us that, that grace to be growing in you, that you would raise up leadership from uh, our, our very body, those who can step into positions of teaching and directing and guiding, and, or that each one would be active in pursuing the one another's that you have given for us to do. We cry out that you might accomplish this in an ever-increasingly effective way. Father, along with this, we ask that we might see more people coming to know you, that there might be those who put faith and trust in you as a result of the powerful and spirit-filled proclamation of the gospel that is done in full conviction and is combined with a holy life and those who proclaim it. There would be many who come to know you, that our church will be added to in numbers in that way. And Father, we ask that there would be many who would be able to come and hear the truths of your word. Father, we know that you are the one who brings growth in every way. And we ask that you might bring it as is appropriate and as we are able to to shepherd and to guide and direct in ways that please you. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Or if you would, uh, open your Bibles to Philippians uh, chapter 3. This is a passage that is near and dear to my heart. When I was, oh, I think I was in seventh grade, I got in trouble in school. I know you can't imagine that. Uh, I was going to a Christian school, and I got in a fight. I mean, of all the things, I, I, I've never been a fighter. Um, I'm neither a lover nor a fighter, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't do either one of those things well. Uh, by the Lord's grace, I, I, I hope I love better than I fight always. Uh, but somehow, I, I forget what prompted it. I do remember, I, I remember, you know, this guy being on top of me. I think he was, he was beating me up, but uh, I, think, I think I had helped start it. And so we got in big trouble at school. It was a Christian school I was going to at the time and, in seventh grade. And I was a goody two-shoes to the max. And so I was horrified that I would be in trouble. And, and I had all kinds of defensiveness as to why I shouldn't have been. And I got home and I really expected that my mom would give me all kinds of care and comfort. Now, in seventh grade, I already should have known better. I mean, my mom was very caring and comforting, but uh, she said, you did what? And, and what kind of excuses are you making for? I mean, she is, I mean, let me have it for all my excuses. And she goes, well, what I want you to do is memorize the book of Philippians. Actually, memorize Philippians chapter 1. It's like, Mom, a, a whole chapter of Scripture, what are you doing? And I don't know why she picked Philippians. I don't know what was going on in her life. 
My mom has just been a faithful, dear saint since she was about 30 years old. The Lord has saved her radically. And so I don't know what was going on, but she said, memorize the first chapter. And then after I did that, she was, that's kind of my means of punishment, I guess. After that, she said, well, I really want you to memorize the rest of the book. And so she kind of gave me a, a schedule to do that. And uh, since that time, the book of Philippians has been for me just a special place to go and just, and, and just be refreshed in my soul. And so Philippians chapter 3 in particular, and, and I'm going to read verses 1 through um, 14. They're really kind of, it's really all one, one big thought. I'm really only going to look at verses 7 and 8. We're going to look at verses 7 and 8 this morning. But I want to read the whole thing and then just kind of pick out a few things about what it means to, to not compromise the surpassing value of Christ. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble for me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more, circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may be laid hold of Excuse me, in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward towards what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Wow. And where, where do you even start there? As the Apostle Paul just unleashes this. First, first he starts out saying, look, I'm warning you. I'm going to write the same things. You know, I've said this before. He's already mentioned in his letter. I'm, I'm telling you stuff I've already told you, but that's good because when I do that, it provides, it enables you to be warned. He goes, it's no trouble for me to write the same things. I love to do it. And it safeguards you. Because you've heard this passage. You've heard it over and over, many of you. Some of you have memorized it. You're familiar with it, and yet it is good to hear it again. And then he launches into this really severe warning. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. There's people out there who are trying to steal your faith or, or minimize your faith or really essentially take your eyes off Jesus. That's the issue. Whether it's for those who weren't believers at all and so they would have their eyes diverted and never become believers because they would be focusing on Jewish rituals and legalism. That's the dogs, evil workers, false circumcision, those who claim uh, Jewish, uh, Judaizers most likely, who are saying, look, you can have Christ maybe, but you, you must have the circumcision, you must have the, uh, the law, you must obey that in order to be uh, truly uh, a believer. But the whole idea here was that either, again, believe, unbelievers who would never focus on Christ because they focused on those other things, or believers who would have their faith weakened because they would take their eyes off Christ and begin either to grasp for things that they'd had before or to add things in currently to their lives which were less than Christ. Fascinating in verse 4, he goes on to kind of remind them that, you know, if, if, if the last part there, verse 3, we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. This is what makes a true child of God, that there is a worship in the Spirit. That's the gift of the Spirit that was given at Pentecost, that was given now to every believer in this age, that's the, when we worship in the Spirit, we're reflecting the nature of the great gift that was given to us in the new covenant that's been provided. And, the, and we glory in Christ Jesus. That, that's foundational. And really, worship in the Spirit always means that you will glory in Christ Jesus. You can't glory in anything else if you worship in the Spirit. It's not a separate thing, really. We worship in the Spirit and we glory in Christ Jesus. To worship in the Spirit is... The reflection, you know that someone is worshiping in the spirit, not because they speak in some strange language or because they have ecstatic utterance or because they do some emotional thing. 
It's if they glory in Christ Jesus. If everything they do brings him glory, the things they say, the things they do, and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. All those three things go together. You can't glory in Christ Jesus if you put confidence in the flesh. But then the Apostle Paul says, well, and, and by the way, for those of you who think, well, why shouldn't we have confidence in the flesh? Because I have a lot to have confidence in. The Apostle Paul says, no, no, let me get ahead of you. I have better reason than any of you to put confidence in the flesh. In a fleshly sense, I'm better than you. I exceed you in every way. I mean, that's what he says. In fact, he says this in Galatians. He says, you know, when I was a Pharisee, I was exceeding beyond all of the expectations of my countrymen, being more zealous for the traditions of my fathers. I was the best Pharisee there was. Nobody out Pharisee Paul. And really, he's, he's talking to Pharisees, to Judaizers. He's almost pointing to them, but it seems as though the Judaizers were giving their teaching, look at us, you know, you, you need to pattern yourselves after us because, you know, we have, we've got this all together. Paul says, no, no, if you want to put confidence in the flesh, I, I can do it better. So he says, if anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. And then he gives us, lays out his fleshly pedigree. Circumcised the eighth day. That is, uh, even as he came, he, his parents followed the law. Even when he couldn't directly follow the law, they followed it for him. They circumcised him. That's when he had to be circumcised. All right, so he, even when he wasn't doing it, someone did it for him, a devout family. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel. It had to be a Jew in order to, to really be pleasing to the Lord in, in this physical sense. But not only that, of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the best tribes, one of the esteemed tribes, Benjamin and Judah being the most esteemed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, I, I did everything Jewish. I, mean, Jew, I put Jewish and my name in Wikipedia. They'd be right there together, right? In, in, the, in the Talmud, it, it, everything, it, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. I mean, he didn't need to say anything more because the Pharisees, what? They were zealous for the law. But he goes on, so not just in, in obedience to the law or, or in his, probably there more, his understanding of the law. I mean, the Pharisees, un, uh, they thought, they understood it. They added to it. They, they, they were experts in the law. But then he says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. So it wasn't just that I was a dry, ivory tower legalist. I was the real deal. I mean, when people didn't do what the law said, I tried to kill them. Because I was zealous, he, he tells us in other places, I was zealous for God. Because he's the God of the law, right? The God of the Old Testament. So I didn't just sit around contemplating what should be done according to the law. I wasn't, a, I wasn't even a, a legalistic legalist. I was an active legalist. I, I, he said, I did everything. I persecuted the church. And then as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. So not only did he know the law, but he actually practiced it, which most Pharisees didn't. He actually did practice the law. He did all that he could to try to be righteous underneath the law. And he calls himself blameless. Now, again, I don't think that means he thought that he never sinned, but he was following the law, and part of the law was what? The sacrificial system. So he came underneath that. When he sinned, he went to the, went to the temple. He recognized that he sinned. He went there, got his sins, as it were, taken care of and, and covered as he went to the temple, and so he was obeying everything the law said. So he was blameless. God was covering his sins. He, he was convinced because of his following of the law, including the sacrificial system. As to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. So guys, he had the perfect pedigree. He had every reason to put confidence in his flesh. And then he makes this incredible contrast, but. And this is the strongest word. There's different kinds of contrasts in Scripture, ways that, different words that you can use for the word but. But this is the strongest one, but. In spite of all of that, or really in light of all those things which ultimately are worthless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And the first point that I would like for us to contemplate this morning is that knowing Christ is more valuable than anything we used to trust in. Knowing Christ is more valuable than anything we used to trust in. Now, I'm not going to make you raise your hands, but well, I will. How many of you came to Christ as adults? Raise your hand. Quite a few, okay? What were you trusting in before you came to Christ? Those who came to Christ as adults, what were you trusting in before you came to Christ? You can answer. Was that yourself? All right, but that's, that's most general. But what are, some, what are some specific things that you thought, either this is going to make my life meaningful, whether it was a particularly religious sense or not. Some were not all that religious. And so, but anything, what were you trusting in as your purpose, your course, the thing that was going to be your salvation, as it were? Skills. What's that? Your skills, right? And that's what a lot of the world trusts. I'm good, and I'll get better, and I'll succeed. What else? Positive, sure, positive thinking. I mean... Joel Osteen to the max, right? You've seen, you've, seen, you've seen the picture of his latest book? The Power of I Am? 
I mean, I mean, I mean you just, that just makes me shudder. It's real. It's an actual book. He's actually got it on there. And of, of course, whose face is on it? His. All right. With a little bit more, a little bit more, uh, he's moved a little more postmodern in his hairstyle. It was 80s, kind of plastered on there now. Anyway, that, that matters not. But no, that's the real title of his new book, Joel Osteen, The Power of I Am. Positive thinking is what it's all about. Guys, guys it's huge business. And a lot of the world, as much as we can sometimes kind of mock that or say, how can that possibly be? Millions of people conspire to or, or believe that that's going to be their salvation, their positive mental attitude. What else? What, do you, what did you trust in? Yeah. Sure. And that health then provides me the ability to do things I want, right? I'm going to be healthy. I know this is going to be true, so I'm trusting in my health, my vitality. What else do you trust in? Yeah. Family. It becomes your comfort, your, your, your support, the thing you are working for. What else? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. It's going to be good. Moral. Right? A lot like Paul. What else? Anything? Sure, pleasures. I just, you know, I love, I, love, I love the world. I love the things in it. And so you were, you were trusting that those would actually bring you. Guys, a lot of things people are trusting in. The Apostle Paul was on the religious side. That is trusting in all of the things that were religious. And yet, as, as we will find out, that's, that's not any different than anything else you would trust in, ultimately. It's not any more effective than anything else. The pleasure of, of smoking dope, and that's where my parents grew up, doing all of that and those sorts of things and, and pursuing that sort of thing are no more effective than the pleasures that the Apostle Paul had of being so zealous for Judaism that he killed people. Now, some, well, in, that, in killing people, that wasn't, predict, you know, that wasn't uh, more helpful for society. Some things you choose are more helpful morally, certainly. And they might be of more benefit on kind of an earthly plane, but spiritually they're worthless. But you guys, knowing Christ, and, and you need to remember this. Now, the rest of you who didn't raise your hand obviously were saved when you were younger. That's not a bad thing. It's a really good thing. That's how the Lord designs it. He wants godly offspring and, and families that love and know the Lord. So coming to Christ early is a wonderful thing. But your contrast is, is a little more difficult to see. The things that you were trusting in, well, I was trusting in my diapers. I mean, you know, I was, I was trusting in my, you know, my, my mom to be nice. To, I, you know, it's a little harder to see when you were, came to Christ a little bit younger, but you were still trusting in something other than Christ. And oftentimes those who grow up in Christian families are trusting in their morality, in their niceness, in their obedience to their parents. And on the flip side of that, they're trusting in, them, in, in their ability to find pleasure in the other things. But you guys, I don't know what it was for you. I don't know what you found confidence in, but the Apostle Paul says, anything I used to trust in, I count as law. So he goes, but whatever things, and that's any of the assets that he just mentioned. His lineage, his Jewishness, his Pharisaical lawfulness, his zealous pursuit, his blameless righteousness according to the law, any of those things. Now, again, people trust in, in the fact that I was born in the United States because it's a Christian nation. I was born in a Christian family. I mean, there's all kinds of lineage you can trust in, stuff you can trust in. Apostle Paul says all of that, all of those things, they were gained to me. It's the, it's the strongest form of a, of, of a past tense. They were. N not even any thought, as we will see, that they are of value. Now, they were of gain, but he thought they were of tremendous gain then. Don't forget that. It's easy for us to kind of look back and think, well, yeah, you know, I, I trusted in all that stuff, and now I don't, and I can't believe that I did. Oh, you trusted in it big time. Your life was bound up in it, whether you know it or not. You might have been searching and wrestling and confused, but you were trusting in something other than Christ, and that trust was strong. And you need to remember it. For the Apostle Paul, it's very strong. He's kind of bringing that to the fore. This was my life. This was everything. I was consumed with this. I was sure that this was the way. And if that shifted for you, it doesn't matter. You were still trusting very strongly, as strongly as you possibly could, in something other than Christ. Don't forget that that's where people are. And that's where you were. And it takes a radical change of thinking, as we will see, to see those things as lost, whatever things were gained. That which I thought was, was convinced was to my profit. These are accounting terms, essentially. And Paul's turning into Paul the accountant. And as I was adding up all the things in my ledger, the, the business of my spirituality, my business was flourishing. Everything was in the plus column to me. My lineage and my zeal and my, my, my lawful righteousness, the people that I hung, everything was in the plus column, was all gained. Anything that could be seen as having a spiritual advantage, establishing or enhancing his walk with God, and deepening his relationship with him. And yet every one of those things was apart from Christ and his blessings and provision. The same word, gain, is used in James 4.13. 
where James says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Everything was, all this was profitable. And for Paul, it was profitable in his pursuit of God. That's the amazing thing. Paul was the ultimate religionist. He out-religioned everybody. Because this, everything was about what he thought was pleasing God and establishing a relationship with God. And that's the amazing thing here. And so he says, all this seemed to be gain. But those things, all those previously referenced assets that he has just mentioned here in this chapter, all of those things, I have counted. Very important word. That is to carefully consider, to regard. It is in a, in, in the Bible there are different kinds of tenses. There's an, act, you know, there, there's an active tense and a passive tense. And there's also a middle tense. There's not a lot of middle tenses, actual middle tenses in the Bible. This I think is a real one where he says, look, I consider this for my own personal benefit and gain. The middle tense enhances and strengthens that idea. I counted this for me. That's the idea. For my benefit. And to count is, again, to regard, to deem, to, to think about something in a particular way, to carefully consider it. Not to just, you know, have it enter your mind a little bit. The middle tense enhances and strengthens this to the Apostle Paul was consumed with, with, with constantly considering is, is what I'm doing valuable in my pursuit? He was a man who thought about these things. Now, a lot of us you know, didn't, didn't really, you know, th- don't think about things that way. And certainly as believers, we don't think about them well enough now. Because these things now, I, I in, in the positive sense now, I have counted as loss. I reckon them to, I look at them in a, with, with a new point of view in a different way. Maybe we could paraphrase this by saying, I've done the math. I looked at the profit column that I thought was, in, and then my whole, the whole world of my mathematics, my my, what was profit and what was lost got turned upside down. And so now the things that I counted as gain, I count as loss. That is damage, disadvantage, forfeit, loss of profit. And really the idea here is something that stops being an advantage and turns to disadvantage. The very things that were seen to be of greatest value in achieving what was of greatest value to the Apostle Paul, right, are now seen as damaging baggage, actually something that kept him from what was at that time his objective. He thought that he was pursuing the true God. It is interesting that he, all the, the gain, as it were, those things that were gained, or all that was, uh, whatever things were gained to me, that's in the, uh, the plural. And then he says, that these things I've counted as loss, all right, for the sake of Christ, that's singular. Like, he took all of the individual things, piled them into one column, and said, it's all one big loss. Everything piled together is just one big loss. He wasn't giving differing values, as it were, to his assets. Some, some were more of a loss than others. No, it just all added up to one big loss. And all of this, and, 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 and vitally for us in our text, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. That's the thing that changed his thinking. That's what turned his math, his, his profit and loss understanding, his economics understanding, that's what turned everything on its head. And it's interesting that the word counted there, uh, the verb there, is used in what's called a perfect tense. That is something that happened in the past and something that he continues to think. So it, it's not only he counted them as loss back then, but now every time he looks back and considers what came before, he still sees it as loss. That's the idea. It was lost then. It was a point in time. I saw Christ. Paul's on the Damascus Road. Christ bursts into his thinking, knocks him off his donkey, says, you know, I am Christ whom you are persecuting. He has a radical conversion. From that moment, he sees everything that he did before as loss, and he continues to see it that way. He hasn't changed his mind about the past. And of course, that's what he's telling the, his, the, the church at Philippi. Be careful that you don't do that. That you don't begin to think that the things that you thought were gained before and then you set aside that you go back to thinking that maybe they are gain. You, you knew they were lost, you came to Christ, and now the Judaizers show up, and you begin to see them, maybe, maybe there's something beneficial in them. Can you think of anybody that did that? Well, the Apostle Peter, who sets aside, who, you know, who, who's the first one to see Gentiles come to Christ. And he knows that it's Christ alone, and faith in Christ is the word of God. He, know, he understands this, he preaches this to the Jerusalem council, to the Jerusalem elders when they, when they confront him and say, what are you doing allowing Gentiles? He goes, look, it's, it's by faith in Christ alone. But then he goes to Galatia. 
And he's eating then with the, with the Gentiles because he had the freedom to do that. But some Judaizers come as though from James. And Paul says, when I saw that Peter was not being straightforward about the gospel, I confronted him to his face because he started to pull, hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. It may be that Peter didn't actually think that there was value, but he was being swayed by the Judaizers to stop living out the values of Christ and the nature of his salvation. And he started to move backwards as though those things were of some value. Be careful, that can happen to you. Or someone say, well, I'll, I'll go back and pick up some of that stuff and, and maybe I'll bring some of that back into my life. And for some of you, that, since it wasn't the religious side of things, it's the pleasure side of things. We'll talk about that. But all of a sudden, you know, I, I've, I've been giving that up for a while, but that, that's, starting to, that's starting to have some greater appeal now again. Why, why did I give it up like that? It's starting to have some value to me again. And so maybe I'll add a little bit of that back into my life and, and I'll, I'll make that a little bit more my reason and my purpose for living as opposed to Christ. Oh, that's easy, easy for that to happen. Apostle Paul says, look, I counted those things as loss. I continue to view them as loss. My view of them has not changed at all. And that's because I see Christ. I saw Christ so clearly. And by implication, as we will see, I continue to see him so clearly, his value. That he is the one that enables me to have a right relationship with God. That he is the one who forgives my sins. That he is the perfect and holy Messiah. That he is my Lord, as we will see, my master and my ruler. That none of these other things is worth the rulership of my soul except for Christ. All of this for the sake of Christ. The idea here is not just, just because of, of only just simply seeing that Christ is valuable, but for the sake of having a true relationship with him. That's the idea, as we will see. The idea I did this for the sake of Christ is not just, well, I saw that Christ was great, so I thought I should make a change. No, I saw that Christ was great, and I wanted a relationship with him above all things. So we'll see in the next verse, he says, he calls it the, the knowledge of Christ, knowing Christ. Not, not, just, not just being aware of Christ and seeing the value of Christ, but wanting to have a relationship with him. That's what drove Paul. And think about it. That, that's the only thing that drives, that's what drives a true believer. Not just more information about Jesus, not just seeing that he's better than the worldly system or, or that he somehow supersedes it in an intellectual way, but the heart that's been changed by the Spirit of God through the truths of the Word of God longs for a relationship with God because that's what we were built for. The first desire of a heart that has been regenerated by the Spirit of God through the Word of God is to love Christ. It's the first desire that springs from the heart. And so repentance and faith immediately follow because sin keeps us from loving Christ. And the work of Christ is the only thing that enables us to enter into a relationship with God through Christ and to know Christ intimately ourselves. Christ cannot be gained with those things. He said, I, I did this it, that I may gain Christ for the sake of Christ. And since he can't be gained with those other things, then it is necessary that we drop them so that we might be in right relationship with God through Christ. So knowing Christ is more valuable than anything we used to to trust in. Anything that came before, anything that we thought was gained for us. Maybe again, the right Christian family, the right Christian nation, the right socioeconomic background, the right religious pedigree. Paul's the poster child for the concept that good works apart from Christ, by the way, are filthy rags. There, there are some, you know, you talk to people, again, you talk to some who are immersed in what we might call the more positive sins, for lack of, of, of the, excuse me, the more negative sins. That is, you know, they're, they're sleeping with their girlfriends and their and boyfriends and they're, you know, doing drugs and these things that we think are kind of the, these are the negative sinfulness. We call people away from that. And you stand at people's doors who are not doing those things and are self-righteous and, and oftentimes even attending churches and yet they are trusting in those things. Paul is, Paul, he is the poster child for the fact that our every good deed apart from Christ is what? Filthy rags. We learned that in, in, in Isaiah where it says all, you know, all our good deeds are as a filthy garment. So it's not just our evil deeds apart, our seemingly the more negative evil deeds apart from Christ. It is anything that is good that isn't in Christ or for the purpose of Christ or because we want to know Christ. All of those things are in the lost column as well. Next point, then, is that knowing Christ is more valuable than anything we might ever trust in. Not only is knowing Christ more valuable than anything we did trust in or have trusted in, knowing Christ is more valuable than anything we might ever trust in. 
and one of the reasons that I desired to, that I wanted to, to go over these two verses with you this morning is because I, I sense, and that's, maybe that's a bit of a, an ethereal word, I don't know. It seems to me, seem, seems good to me to, to evaluate where our church is at, and I feel like there is a spiritual lull. It just seems that perhaps we've gotten busy, not even so much with church things so much, that, that we've gotten a bit distracted maybe from our goal and, and that a passion for Christ seems to be perhaps lagging a bit. Now again, for, for many, I mean, we're excited in many ways about the leadership the Lord is bringing, about things that are going on, about, about health, spiritual health in certain ways, but it just seems that there's maybe a bit of a, a lethargy and an, and, and an apathy. And you, you can't fix that by saying, well, you need to come to small group more often. Now we can challenge to do that. We ought to. You know, just show up to more men's meetings. You know, those are things we need to do, but th those are outflows of a spiritual passion, picking the ministries and plugging into the church in the way that is most effective and being vibrant and joyful in doing so. Second Corinthians 11, 3 says, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Now, Kind of, kind of uh, ironically, the idea of simplicity and purity, which is so often in our day equated with uh, a lack of any kind of doctrinal discussion, is, is, is found, the, the idea of pursuing Christ with passion is greater than all things, is found in one of the most intensely doctrinal passages in the book of, in the book of Philippians. He's, gonna, he's talking about justification and righteousness found in Christ and, that it can't, you know, and the value of who Christ is and what he's done. Those are all deeply doctrinal things. So purity and simplicity of devotion to Christ is not knowing less about Christ and less about his work and diving, you know, not, it's, it's not doing less of diving deep into who he is. It is actually participating in those realities. And to have purity and simplicity of devotion is to say all the other complexities as it were of life, the things that would drive me, I'm setting those aside so that I can pursue Christ alone. That's purity and simplicity. Not again, not, not, not diving into the, to the, to the depths of who Christ is and what he's done. And so I'm just, I would like to bring this to you by way of encouragement, not only for you, but for myself as well. I was at the wedding last night, Matt and Abigail's wedding, Matt and Abigail Brown, and uh, I love weddings. I mean, just uh, such a beautiful picture of Christ. I love Christian weddings. Uh, uh, really, all weddings are good in one sense because the Lord has ordained it, but where Christ is presented and the Christ in the church, the, the love that's there is, is presented. I mean, they're, they're sweet, sweet times. But in the middle of that really sweet time, I digress a bit, um, my, my daughter was looking, she was, she was hugging me from behind and looking at my hair. She's like, Daddy, you got, you're, you're gray. That's white. Then she started picking my hair. That's all white back there. And I'm like, shh, be quiet. Don't tell anybody. I'm getting old. And what I've, what I've found, unfortunately, is that I get older. Although there is a greater passion for Christ in many ways, that it, life has gotten more complex for me. I thought that it would get maybe more simple as my son grew up. He's still at the home, so I guess it's more complex there. But I, I watch you guys who have sons and daughters who leave. They never leave. And they're always calling and they're always texting. and They're always saying, we need help with this and that. And life just gets more complex. There are more things to draw me away from purity and simplicity of devotion to Christ, not less. I don't think my passion by the Lord's grace is less, but I, there's more opportunities to be drawn away because of all the things that are going on. And our congregation has aged since I've been here. You're, you're not all old people, but, but you're getting there. Now, it's also gotten younger in many ways. But I wonder if some of you in the aging and in the more complexities of things you face and children going through difficult times, which when I got here, they weren't. They're, you know, they're, they're, in, they're, they're six years old, seven years. I mean, how difficult is that? It can be difficult. I've got two difficult ones. I, but it's not the same difficulty as, as, as a young person walking away from Christ and, and rebelling against you directly as they're turning 18, 19, or 20. Those things are distracting you guys. It's not that you should, they shouldn't be dealt with, but they're hard. And I wonder, I wonder if have, as we've aged a bit, that we've gotten distracted. We start to focus maybe on, on things other than purity and simplicity of devotion to Christ. And that's what I want to call us back to. I have to constantly call myself back to that. And as a shepherd, I have to constantly call you back to that. It might not be your family. It might be something else. You might have, again, as we'll see, decided that some other thing is now more important or starts to call your heart again because we're sinful that way. But you guys, knowing Christ is not only more valuable than everything you used to trust in, it's also more valuable than anything that's going to show up now. Any complexity that's going to show up in your life, any pleasure that's going to show up, any system that's going to show up, any political difficulty that's going to show up, 
I wonder if that sapped our strength a little bit as, a, as our, it's been not so easy for us now politically and, and things have begun to, to turn in some bad directions, if that started to sap your attention. And anxiety and, and nervousness perhaps over those things, you start to close up a little bit towards the church or towards Christ. I wonder if we can't afford to let that happen. What does the Apostle Paul say? More than that. It's a very, very, very interesting. It's a combination of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five prepositions. It's almost like you can't even, it's a, in, Essentially, it is literally, but on the contrary and also. He's saying, look, the, the over and above what used to be, he says. More than that, I count, same word, same, uh, actually different tense. He said he counted as loss the things that came before. He now says, I count, present tense, all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value. And here we have it, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's what it means to gain Christ, knowing him. That's having knowledge about him, knowing him. An intimate, relational love with Christ based on our understanding of his person, character, and work, and our participation in that work with him. More than that, he says, over and above the things that used to drive me, I now, I've had more experience, I've seen more things, I've had more ways to be distracted, it seems like he's saying, and as I've seen every one of those, I've set them aside because Christ is more valuable. Everything is counted as loss. Not just my old Judaizing tendencies. I've now seen more other things that could draw me away, and I've chosen at each point in time, each moment to say, that can't be gain. It's loss because it's not Christ. Everything that came up, other religious systems, the, the apostle Paul's desire for comfort or security, as he wrestles with his churches, maybe longing to say, well, I'm, I'm done with this, enough of this. This is too hard to bear. Through the physical things that he went through. No, all of those temptations, the Apostle Paul says, I counted all things. And this is, I am counting, a very strong present continuous tense. Everything that comes into view that isn't Christ gets set aside as the reason for living, as what drives our motivation, as what is the foundation and purpose of our lives. Guys, guys you've got to care for your kids. As I grow older, you've got to take care of them when they call and when they text. I'm not saying, sorry, you know, Jesus, or Jesus, Chris said that I have to be more focused on Christ than you. No, it's how you solve those issues with your kids and how you work through those things as you continue to relate to the body of Christ and to Christ himself. Don't get distracted. Peter O'Brien, who wrote my favorite commentary on Philippians, says, the present rejection of the old world is the continual affirmation and concrete action of the crucial decision of the past, which he has already counted as loss. What he has already counted as loss, he counts as loss again and again, and any new thing added is equally loss. What are you distracted with now? What's the new thing that has come up in your life that you would then place in front of your purity and simplicity of devotion to Christ? What seems to be more valuable to you now than a passionate pursuit of Christ with everything you are, it's that thing you have to count as loss now, because Christ is more valuable. He hasn't changed. He is the eternal Son of God who was incarnated through Mary on this earth to live a perfect life and to take the wrath of God for your sins and to burst from the tomb on the third day and ascend back to heaven to continue to rule the universe and hold it together with his very power. The one who loves you and has poured out his grace, he's intimate with you, he's provided you with his word, he's given you his spirit, he is in him, all things hold together. He is the reason for all things, whether you acknowledge it or not. So acknowledge it. What does Ephesians 1 say? That the summing up of all things in Christ is the predetermined purpose of God since before creation. Everything sums in him. So why not acknowledge it, admit it, and pursue it now, counting everything that isn't the summing up of things in Christ as loss. William Hendrickson says we may think of such matters as this, as things like making too much of earthly possessions, delighting in intimate fellowship with, with, with our friends and neighbors. Anything that might come to us now, work accomplish anything that we maybe even didn't wrestle with before, he says, I count them all to be, again, active, present. I count them to be loss. They remain a disadvantage. Anything that pulls you away from Christ. Lust, personal gain, Comfort, money, power, position, laziness, family, education, hobbies, theology, for the pursuit of theology alone, you name it, it can, it can be used as a distraction. Guys, what's sapping your energy? What's pulling you away from Christ? Have you stopped focusing on the precious value of the one who, who saved your soul, who died for you? 
who cares for you, who is your Lord. Notice what he says, I count all things lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The surpassing value. There's no stronger way to put that. It rises above everything else. And again, it's not just information about this idea of knowing as, as we trace it through the scriptures, his infinite relationship with the Old Testament concept going, going as far as the knowing of Adam, of Eve in, in the physical intimacy. God's knowing of, for knowing, for loving Israel, for loving individual believers as he chooses them from before the beginning of time. It's the longing of the surpassing value of being an intimate relationship with Christ. Colossians 2.2 2 that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth which comes from a full assurance of understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What's become more important to you to learn about? What's become more important for you to know than the Savior of your souls? You need to know him, deepen in him, understand him more, live out his principles more deeply with more fervency because he's worth it and because that is what, it, what builds and establishes and deepens our relationship with him and we long above all things to, to be continually growing in that intimate relationship with our Savior. Ephesians 3, 17, so that Christ, this is the prayer of the Apostle Paul for spiritual strength in the Ephesians and spiritual strength results in this so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ. I think they can apply in both ways. The love that he gives and the love of him, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And he says, Christ Jesus, he uses all, all the names of Jesus here. Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus, the, the incarnate God, the human, fully human, and then my Lord my master, the one who, who is worthy of all my allegiance, the one before whom I bend the knee. Well, what other lords are you allowing in? Who, who, are you, what, who and what are you bending the knee to? Everything is of lesser value than the infinite value of Christ. I think it's, do you think it's going to bring you pleasure? You set it aside for a while and now it's like, well, I just would like to get a little bit more pleasure back from that. Was well, it because you're not finding your pleasure in Christ? Because you're not pursuing Him? You're not deepening in your knowledge of Him? You started to coast? I know, of my, I know uh, as much of Christ as I need to. Really? Really you know of Christ as much as you need to? You understand Scripture so fully and you've lived it out so fully that you're done? Because you don't need to deepen it. It's like saying to your wife, walking in one day and saying, hey, hon, I know as much about you as I need to know. We've been talking to each other for 26 years. Done. Right? I, I don't need to know you anymore. I, I don't need to learn any more about you. Don't even talk to me. We don't even need to talk. Because I've got you figured out, babe. Now, see how that works. <laughs> and see how that strengthens your marriage. Always more to know. And Christ is infinitely more complex than your wife, man. I know that sounds hard to believe. <laughs> and, and yet, this is what we continue to do. Because he is Christ Jesus, your Lord. He is of infinite value. Anything that does not put us or keep us in joyful, fulfilling relationship with him is of lesser value. What's stealing your joy? And guys, these can be very real and very difficult things. It might be your children, as it were, stealing your joy. You're letting them do it. Don't let it happen. You can't make them stop sinning. You can keep them from stealing your joy and from distracting you, even as you work through your difficulties with them, distracting you from the purpose of honoring and pleasing Christ. Maybe it's your job. Again, maybe it's your pleasures. Maybe it's, maybe it's you know, external difficulties you're facing. Maybe it's being caught up in the political situation. I don't know what it is. Christ is infathomably valuable. Now, the next point that Paul makes is that Christ, knowing Christ, is worth actually losing everything we ever trusted in or could trust in. You see the progression? Knowing Christ is more worthy, or it's worth losing everything we ever trusted in, counting that as loss. Knowing Christ is worth more than everything we could ever trust in. And knowing Christ is actually worth, not, not just considering those things lost, but it's worth actually losing everything you could trust in or did trust in. And that's what he says here. More than that, I count all things to be lost, still the, the, the consideration, the viewing, the understanding, 
in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. This was not ivory tower Christianity. I know Christ is valuable. I know this, Chris. I've heard this over and over. I get it. I know what he's done. I know who he is. You can't tell me any more about that. Are you actually losing everything for him? Setting it aside at any moment when it could be more, you are actively setting it aside to say, I will not pursue that in my thinking, in my value system. I won't allow it to eclipse Christ. At every moment, actually losing it. And the Apostle Paul, by the Lord's grace, had much of this done to him. What are the, what are the kinds of things that he suffered? 1 Corinthians 4, 9, he speaks of what it's like to be an apostle. He says, For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we've become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent. This is 2 Corinthians. Uh, no, it's, I'm sorry, still, it's 1 Corinthians. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we're both thirsty and hungry, we're poorly clothed, roughly treated, we're homeless, we toil, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When we're slandered, we try to conciliate. We become as the scum of the earth, the dregs of all things, even unto now. Apostle says, I've, I've lost all things. All the other things that I thought could be gained, I've set them aside. And the Lord has, by his grace, put me in the position where I have to. So that's what apostles do. That, that's what believers do. We don't consider ourselves trying to gain all the things of the world or the scum of the earth, as it were when it comes to the things that the world would see as important. As he uh, battles his opponents in 2 Corinthians 11, he says, Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so, in far more labors, imprisonments, beaten times without number, in danger of death, five times from the Jews, 39 lashes, three times beaten with rods, once stoned, three times shipwrecked, a night and the day in the deep, frequent journeys, dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've lost everything. Everything I could have trusted in. The Lord has taken from me and I rejoice. We haven't, any of us I think had that serious of, of a loss. But we have the privilege and opportunity to count things and then live things out as loss by dying to ourselves daily. The things which would seem to grab our attention away from Christ. 2 Timothy 4, 6. Maybe this sums it up. He says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time for my departure has come. My whole life is just to be poured out upon the sacrifice and service of the faith of God so that others might be presented as, as a fragrant aroma to him. Guys, is that how you view your life? It's like, it's like taking the drink offering and pouring it on the altar and poof, it's gone as it rises up to a fragrant aroma to the Lord. It's here for a moment and gone, but the whole purpose was to facilitate the sacrifice and cause it to be pleasing and honoring to the Lord. That's what you're here for. And the other things seem so important and they seem to grasp so much of our attention, but we are here to be drink offerings. Isn't that we can't enjoy the good things the Lord has given and care for our families and, 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 and have the opportunity to pursue good and righteous things, but it all is underneath the surpassing value of Christ. Otherwise, our church grows cold and stale. It doesn't matter what programs or ministries we put together. It doesn't matter what opportunities we have to gather together. When our hearts want something other than Christ, it's always cold. And there's nothing else that will jumpstart it except a remembrance that everything that has come, everything that will come, everything that could come is worthless in comparison to Christ. In fact, it is so worthless. The final point is this. Knowing Christ makes everything we lose nothing more than worthless filth in comparison. I'm not using the strong words Paul does. Worthless filth is how he viewed the greatest of his religious achievements and anything that could be achieved or pursued apart from Christ. There's very few of us that view the things that we might pursue with that kind of, of, of understanding. He's go, he goes on to say, I have counted, I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them but rubbish. Again, that's a, I, I think that's a, a sanitizing of the translation, excrement, I think is probably the better way to put that. It's used for rubbish, it is, but I, I don't think in the strength of the translation here that that's, that's what it should be. I count as filth, worthless filth. Why? In order that I may gain Christ. I'm not asking you, Paul's not asking you, God is not asking you to give these things up so that you know the, the elders of the church can say, hey, we got a vibrant church. 
or so that you know, we, can, we can look and build some kind of kingdom here. Look at, what, look at what's going on here. Or so that you can say, you know, I'm, I'm achieving something other than Christ. We're asking you to give things up because Christ is better and pursuing him is better. It is a surpassing value. It's only worthless filth when we understand how great Christ actually is because these things don't seem like worthless filth to us. That's the problem. They seem very compelling and that's why they cause us to pursue him. But it's because we don't see Christ rightly. And so it remains ever and always the goal of the elders and the goal of the, of, of, of the leadership and the shepherds of the church to try to show you the value of Christ because only then will you see everything else as worthless filth. Only then will you see nothing is in comparison with him. Nothing is worth pursuing other than him. Not simply because it, it's, it's neutral, but because it's worthless and it's ultimately filth. Scuba on. Refuse, dung, excrement, garbage. Isaiah 64, 6 says, All of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. That's apart from Christ. That's before Christ. That's, that's anything other than Christ. And so you guys, my, my prayer for us as a church, I mean, I hope the fellowship groups are strong. I hope the men's Bible studies go well. I'm excited about the ladies signed up for the Ladies Bible Institute and the guys in SI. I'm excited about all those things. But those, only, those are only reflections. And they will only be effective as we have a passionate pursuit of an intimate relationship with Christ, which comes through the knowledge of Christ. Knowing who he is and putting that into practice and deepening in our understanding of it. Because will we pursue that over these next years? If so, we will overcome our apathy and perhaps the inertia that is beginning to kind of, the weight of the world is kind of dragging us down and will again pursue and maybe more greatly pursue the one thing above all other things that matters. That is the value, beauty, and relationship that we can have with Christ. That's, that's, that's all of our challenge. And I pray that that will be what happens as we step forward into, this coming, into these coming ministries. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the fact that you have called us to worship and to pursue the most valuable, beautiful, powerful, joyful, perfect being in the universe, your son. That you have not called us to some, the worship of some sub-deity or some foolish man. That you have given us the great privilege of worshiping you through your son. And that you sent him to come and to live a perfect life and to take your wrath to rise again on our behalf that we might be able to enter into intimate relationship with you and him. And I pray that we would pursue that above all things in the midst of our distractions and our wrestles, our fears and anxieties, our pleasures and joys. Might you transcend them all. And might the Lord Jesus be our, our passionate pursuit that we might gain him above all other things. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen.